This is the lecture for Thursday of week one. Remember that we are not holding live synchronous Zoom sessions for lecture. We do have them available for lab in case you're not able to come to the in-person component. But for lecture, I think it's just easier if we post things in advance so that nobody is trying to rush to get access to Zoom. Um, so I'm also trying to get this posted early so that if you have time, you can at least listen to it prior to class on Thursday. Um, maybe as you're driving out to campus, if you're coming to campus or if you have some time at home, just to maybe listen to it. Even if you don't take detailed notes, I think it would be very helpful to have at least some familiarity with this information before class on Thursday. So just to review some of the learning objectives, the first is to identify the basic goals of microscopy. So what do we mean by microscopy? How are we doing it? But then also, what is the point of it? What do we accomplish using this technology? Well, think about some properties of light. Um, I know that physics and chemistry are challenging for a lot of folks. Uh, they definitely were for me when I was in college, but we'll kind of review some of the very basics that we use for technology in microbiology and then apply that to micros microscopy specifically. So uh, before I keep going, I just want to mention microscopy is using a microscope. It's the act of using a microscope to examine microscopic things. And it's kind of a catch all term for anything you do that involves slide preparation, staining and looking at stuff under a microscope. Um, so we'll also think about this idea of resolving power and total magnification. Those are two measurements that I want you to be familiar with, and you'll need to be able to do really simple calculations or comparisons of in quizzes and exams. You should distinguish between the two-dimensional and three-dimensional aspects of microscopy, and then we'll look at seven types of light microscopy and two types of scanning microscopy. Um, and really that should say electron microscopy, there's scanning and transmission. Um, so we'll uh, get back to that in just a moment. So two types of electron microscopy. Um, before I go much further on that, there is an assignment that's due that's a microscopy worksheet. So ideally, if we were meeting face to face, I would have the worksheet printed out for you and you would just fill it out as we go along and then do the review questions at the end of class or throughout the, the lecture um, in partners or anything like that. We don't have the ability to do that together. So I really recommend having that worksheet out um, you can do it on your computer, you can print it out and then scan it to PDF after the fact, but just refer to it as you go along so that you can fill out some information about these types of microscopy and just get that worksheet knocked out of the way, have that study resource available, and then get it submitted. Um, it's not due until uh, one week from Thursday, so August 20th. Um, so you have some time to do it, but I encourage you to get it done as quickly as possible. Okay, so getting into properties of light and general information about microscopy and how we use that light. Um, first, remember that we use a microscope to see tiny things. We kind of talked about this when we defined microbes and microorganisms and talked about different types of microbes for the Tuesday lecture. But basically anything that is beyond the resolving power of our own eyes, we rely on a microscope to see it and resolve different details about it. So we magnify and then resolve the image using a microscope. I'll get back to those terms in just a moment. We can divide that word up into micro and scope. Micro is Greek for small. Scope is Greek for aim or target. So like um, a periscope on a submarine or a scope on a rifle, that is a way to aim or target at something. So um, as often as possible, I want to teach you what words mean. I think there's so much terminology in biology, and especially if you're taking anatomy right now too, or if you're planning to take it soon, um, 
understanding the naming conventions will get you so much farther than just trying to memorize everything. Um, so as often as you can, try to, if you see a word that looks like a lot, just break it up into smaller pieces and take them one step at a time. You'll oftentimes be able to solve problems that way. So when we're looking through a microscope, there's a couple of different ways we can visualize our sample. If we're using a scanning electron microscope like this image or a dissecting scope, for example, we have a lot more ability to resolve the three dimensional surface of the object. So these are pollen granules released from a plant um, that are seen using a scanning electron microscope. This is also a pollen granule, but um, it is seen through what is called a transmission electron microscope. So TEM instead of SEM. These microscopes show just a tiny slice of an object. So a lot of two dimensional surface, but no three dimensional aspect to it. Um, the compound light microscopes that we use tr try to pretty much flatten objects. So even though the objects that we see are three dimensional, usually we're just looking at a slice of them using the microscopes that we use in lab. So getting into some of those basic properties of light that allow us to view objects three dimensionally or two dimensionally in different ways, um, light is really weird, um, but oftentimes it behaves and interacts with objects and specifically a sample under a microscope as a wave. So when we study a wave, we might think about the amplitude of the wave, and we also think about the wavelength. So in a specific time point or um, time period, so unit time, how many waves do we have? If we have a small, short wavelength, that leads to a higher frequency because we have more of those waves occurring per unit time. The bigger the wavelength, the lower the frequency. So the longer the wavelength, the less waves there are per unit time, the lower the frequency. So kind of keep that definition of wavelength and that conceptualization of wavelength in mind because as we talk about different wavelengths of light, that's going to help us understand the power of those wavelengths. So one way to kind of uh, visualize this a little bit inaccurately, just to kind of keep it in your head. Um, so according to a rainbow, the start of the rainbow, so red, orange, yellow, often have much longer wavelengths, and then green, blue, purple uh, tend to be a lot shorter. So those shorter wavelengths are actually a lot more powerful, um, which is kind of counterintuitive, but the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and the more powerful that light. So if you've ever shot light through a prism before, you know that that prism kind of splits the light into different wavelengths, which is why you get a rainbow. And that light is arranged actually according to wavelength. So again, blues and purples are in this 400 nanometer range um, for wavelength, then getting into green about 500, and then reds are over 700 nanometers. So that tends to, uh, to again be um, lower power light. There's bigger wavelengths, lower frequency, but if you think about something like ultraviolet or x-rays or even gamma radiation and cosmic radiation, which factor into science fiction a lot, those shorter wavelengths and extremely short wavelengths beyond the visible light spectrum are very powerful. So those blues and uh, greens even are going to be a lot more useful for trying to resolve images. So that wavelength of light really affects its energy levels, it affects how it travels, and also how it interacts with fluorescent dyes. Um, this is kind of the same basic principle about why coral communities and um, the bottom of the ocean kind of look a little bit differently than in terms of color than the uh, way that we perceive things on land because those different wavelengths of light travel through the water in different ways. So we'll get into what that idea is in just a moment. First, I wanted to define some other terms. 
So when we're thinking about this idea of reflection, um, right now I'm wearing a pink shirt. So if you were looking at me in person and you saw my shirt, you would say it's pink. But what's really happen happening is um, all of the other wavelengths of light are getting absorbed by my shirt. And then the shirt is bouncing back that pink wavelength of light. So that is reflection. The wave is bouncing off of a particular material and that's how we perceive color. So when you look at a plant, the pigments in that plant absorb every wavelength of light except green oftentimes. So that absorbance is material capturing the energy of a light wave. Um, this is basically how we measure how advanced a culture is in broth culture. If you have like a, a liquid suspension of bacterial culture, you can put it into a machine that will kind of shoot light at it and measure how much of it is absorbed by that sample. The inverse of that is transmittance. So how much light is not absorbed out of the total amount of light shot at the object. Diffraction means bending through small openings and scattering. So this diffraction of light is important for like the machinery part of the microscope. Um, this diffraction increases as the object size decreases relative to the wavelength. And refraction is increasing incredibly important for microscopy. Um, so uh, this time last year when I was teaching this particular lecture, there was a big news story about Chrissy Teigen um, and she uh, was accused of photoshopping this image of her um, because she was in the water and the light was refracting in a weird way. So it, to someone who doesn't understand properties of light, it maybe makes sense to look at that and say, okay, it's photoshopped, but it wasn't remotely photoshopped. It's just the way light travels through water. So whenever light passes through into a different medium, it changes direction. That medium could be oil, it could be air, it could be glass, it could be the sample you're working with. So whenever you're shooting light out, you have to account for the fact that a good portion of it is refracting. It's not necessarily being focused. So that is a really important component of microscopy, and we'll explore that a little bit more on the next slide. So here you see um, some examples of refraction. So first, the refraction itself is how we actually focus light in a microscope. We refract off of a convex lens and that helps to focus the light and magnify the image. So that magnification is very important, but we'll see in a moment that magnification on its own doesn't really help you if you can't get a very clear image. So one way that we get a very clear image is something called oil immersion microscopy, which we see up here in the top right. So if we have this light source shooting light out, it's going to pass through this slide and through the specimen, but then it has to be captured by this lens up here. If we're on a very strong objective and really trying to zoom in on that object, um, any refracted light is going to disrupt our perception of that object and our magnification of the object go passing through that convex lens. So part of this is because when that light passes through the glass uh, of the slide as well as through the object and maybe a cover slip, it refracts out into the air. So there's space between the object and the lens that is capturing the light that helps us image that object. So the solution here is to get rid of the air and we do that using immersion oil. So immersion oil, as you can see here, physically touches the slide and it also physically touches the objective lens. These should only ever be used on the 100x objective, the strongest or longest appearing objective that you'll see on your microscopes. So that immersion oil actually fills in this area and it helps the light go through from the light source through the object and then into the objective lens where it's captured without any of it refracting out. 
So um, another note is that prisms and concave lenses uh, redirect light that's done throughout the microscope to bring it to our eyes, but that refraction is really important. And so in order to view something really tiny like bacterium, when we need to use that 100x objective, we have to use that immersion oil to focus the light. So we mentioned that one goal of microscopy and probably the most obvious goal of microscopy is to see things that are too small for you to see. So in order to do that, we have to magnify. So that's zooming in on something. Um, magnification overall is how big something appears. Here, the image on the left, these are both images of the same strawberry. The image on the left is less zoomed in and the image of, on the right is more zoomed in or magnified. So what you'll notice here is that this image that you see right here is less of the overall two-dimensional surface of the strawberry. So it's maybe a region like this or probably more accurately, a region like this in the center, because as you zoom in, you're zooming into the center of whatever you focused on. So again, you see less of the overall two-dimensional surface, but you see more details that you were not able to resolve before. So when we're looking at magnification, again, you have to be able to resolve those details. Um, this idea of empty magnification is when you have great magnification, but really poor resolution. So resolution is actually seeing those details. Um, here, if you zoom in, but you really don't fix the resolution, you know that you've zoomed in. You know that there's probably some stuff here, but it's, imp it's impossible to resolve the image. Here... It's maybe the same slide, but every time you zoom in on it, you take a quick moment to just subtly adjust your resolution. You don't have to use what we call the coarse focus knob. You can just very, make tiny adjustments in order to make sure that you have good resolution. And that's only if your microscope is capable of doing that resolution. So again, magnification on its own isn't enough. There's other goals to microscopy. So when we're thinking about resolution, what resolution actually is, is the smallest, the minimum distance at which you can distinguish two separate structures. So for example, if we look at a low res image, a low resolution image, um, in this one, for example, you can't really tell where Batman ends and Gotham begins. It's all just kind of a blur. It's a blurry low resolution image. But if we have a high res image, and we can see all these details quite clearly. So there's um, a smaller distance that we can actually distinguish. There's kind of a higher resolution. So when we're calculating resolution or you know looking at it numerically, what we're really thinking about is resolving power. A high resolution has a very small resolving power because the smaller the resolving power, the smaller the distance at which you can actually separate out two objects as separate and distinct. So in order to calculate that, we multiply 0.61 by the wavelength of light and divide that by something called the numerical aperture. That's how well the lens actually gathers light and resolves the image. So that's a quality of the lens or of the microscope. So when we do this calculation, we have to make sure that we're getting a very small resolving power. So when we're saying high res, remember again, what we really mean is small resolving power. So just so you have an idea of these measurements before we go much further with the calculations, again, you're only as good as your lens and your light. So thinking about the specific lenses and light that's available, the um, resolving power of the human eye is only about 0.2 millimeters. And obviously this is different depending on you know, the distance you're looking at, depending on um, your vision, your prescription, um, but the human eye in general can resolve about objects that are about 0.2 millimeters apart.
Your common light microscope can resolve objects that are about 0.2 micrometers apart. And then your um, normal scanning electron microscope, which isn't so normal, actually resolve about two nanometers apart. So really getting much better magnification and also resolution. So when we're thinking about these calculations, shorter the wavelength, like I mentioned earlier, the more you're able to resolve the image. So remember those wavelengths of you know, uh, in the purple and blue and green range from 400 to about 500 nanometers, those are going to be short wavelengths. And when we do this calculation, the shorter the wavelength, the smaller the wavelength, the lower the numerator, which means a lower overall resolving power. If we have a bigger numerical aperture, that would also, you know, it would increase the denominator. And so that would also result in a lower resolving power. So the stronger the numerical aperture and the, um, and the shorter the wavelength of light, the more uh, likely you are to get a small resolving power, which again means better resolution. So we want to get a smaller resolving power using those short wavelengths of light decreases the resolving power and increases resolution. So those blue and green light wavelengths are short and visible. Um, ultraviolet lights or ultraviolet light wavelength uh, would be much more powerful and would get us a really great resolving power, but we can't see it. So it has to be visible light. So that's the range that we want to work with. So if we were in class, I would have you guys do this question to check in with each other. Um, it's on the worksheet, so it might be helpful for you to turn to the back of the worksheet and look at those review questions. Um, but in this question, the resolving power of your microscope is 0.4 micrometers. Two cocci, which remember are round bacterial cells, are 0.2 micrometers apart on a slide that you've prepared. So the question is, will you be able to distinguish them as two separate cells, or will they simply look like what we call diplococci, two cells that are stuck together? So read through that question a couple times, look at it, think about what, you've know, what you know, think about the definition of resolving power, and then I'll show you how to work through this. So you might just wanna click pause while you work through this. Okay, so in order to work through this, it's important to remember that resolving power is a unit of length. It's the smallest distance that you can actually distinguish. So if we want to distinguish between two objects, the distance has to actually be greater than the resolving power. So if we're looking here, the resolving power is 0.4. The actual distance we're trying to distinguish is 0.2. So here, the resolving power is actually longer than the actual distance. The distance is smaller than the resolving power, so we don't meet this expectation. And so um, we're in this situation here where the distance is smaller than the distance we're able to actually resolve. And so these are just going to look like what we call diplococci. So these are Streptococcus pneumoniae. You can see them, um, these two circles that are actually physically connected. This is a true diplococcus, but you might have a situation where, you know, you see something that kind of looks like that. And then if we were to zoom in and get good resolution, it might actually be a situation where these two circles are so close that they look like they're attached to each other, but they're actually not. But because of the limitations of your microscope, you're not able to see this tiny gap that actually exists between them.
So that was one of the review questions. Hopefully you understand how to answer that now. So another goal of microscopy is to increase what's called the contrast between the specimen that we're looking at and the slide in the background, as well as the contrast within the specimen itself. So what contrast actually is, is the difference between light and dark regions in an image. This is something that we play around with a lot with like Instagram filters. So every time you click a different Instagram filter, there's a different level of contrast. So both of these images are the exact same specimen at the exact same time. The image on the left has very low contrast. There's not much difference between the light and dark regions, but the image on the right has very high contrast. There's more intense extremes of light and dark, and this lets you see a lot of details that you couldn't see in that low contrast image. So in general, specimens have to contrast with their background. Oftentimes we think about the specimen being dark and the background being light, just because of how we're used to looking at stuff under a microscope. But the important thing is that they're different. So refractive index is a way that we measure how well a medium can bend light. We just need there to be different refractive indices between the object, the specimen, and its background. So here, this is what's called a simple stain of E. coli. This is something that was originally planned for Tuesday, but you're actually doing it on Thursday. And then here we see what's called a negative stain of E. coli. So exact same bacterium, but they look a little bit different. In this image on the top, the cells are dark and the background is light. Here, the cells are light and the background is dark but the important thing is that they're different from one another. So the specimen and its background just have different refractive ind indexes or indices for them to contrast with one another. It doesn't matter which one's light or which one's dark. Um, there's benefits to both of them. It's just in order to see them, they have to be different in terms of how well they bend light. So in order to get that contrast, we can do that with staining. Um, that's something that you're going to do a lot this first week, especially on Thursday. Um, that staining can be done with many different types of microscopy. So you can apply it to lots of different types. Um, there's also specific types of microscopy that specifically increase contrast. One of those is phase contrast microscopy, which is pictured here. So that doesn't necessarily involve staining, it's just the way that light gets bent through the microscope that allows us to have increased contrast. So there's a couple of other things about the microscope that I want you to keep in mind, and this is what we mentioned earlier when we were talking about magnification. So as you zoom in on an object, you're losing sight of the bigger picture. When you're, for example, if you're looking at someone's face and you zoom in on their nose, you're missing out on all of the other details of their face. So the more you magnify the image, the smaller your field of view. That's the two dimensional flat area that's visible under the microscope. So for example, this might be an entire tissue slide. These look like little faces, but they're actually what are called vascular bundles. They're found in plants. So if you zoom um, not too much, if you're like at a low magnification, you're gonna have a large field of view. You're gonna see lots of these little faces. But if you zoom in on a one particular face, you're going to have a much smaller field of view with that high magnification. You're gonna see less of the overall two dimensional image, but more details of one part of the image in particular. In terms of the three-dimensional aspect, this is referring to the different layers that are visible under the microscope. So the depth of field is that three-dimensional distance between the nearest and farthest objects that you can actually resolve. Um, one common example now of this is uh, the portrait mode on the iPhone. 
So um, portrait mode is all about having a shallow depth of field. You hyper-focus on the, um, the subject of the image and you blur the background or vice versa. Um, in the image in the middle here, so not portrait mode, there's a very deep depth of field. Both the person in the foreground and the background of the image are in good resolution. So there's benefits to both of those, and it's just a quality of the microscope that as you zoom in, your depth of field gets shallower. So that's important to keep in mind because even though a slide looks very flat to us, it is not flat to the tiny organisms that live there. So if you're trying to focus on an organism that's alive and moving, it might be swimming down from the cover slip on closer to the glass part of the slide or vice versa. It might be moving behind some detritus on your slide. So it's important to remember that these objects are really, really tiny. And in order to get a good resolution, you have to have an awareness of your depth of field. Okay, so getting into some instruments of microscopy, this will help you fill out the uh, those two tables that are on the worksheet. Um, and it goes pretty much in order. Uh, one thing that I wanna add is if you're sitting down and watching this lecture all in one go, please pause it right now. Uh, go get a drink of water, give yourself a two minute or five minute break and then come back to it. Okay, so one object or one microscope that we don't really use in microbiology all this much is what's called a dissecting microscope. This might be useful to view um, histological samples or to view helminths, those different worms. Um, it might be useful also to view what's called colony morphology, looking at an auger plate and seeing uh, the pattern of growth on that plate. So a dissecting microscope is useful for studying whole or tiny organisms, um, or so whole tiny organisms or images under low magnification. It's also useful um, if you uh, don't have any electricity, for example, you can still use this microscope without an external light source. So it's basically like a fancy magnifying glass. You can even use the flashlight on your phone to shine onto the object and illuminate it. And then part of that light will get captured by the microscope. So you can really just use ambient light or other resources without any other electrical source to power this microscope. The images that are taken through a dissecting scope tend to be very, very low magnification. Um, so again, it's just kind of a fancy magnifying glass. It helps you see more detail, but um, not as much as the microscopes that we really need to see individual cells. But what we use for that is a compound light microscope. Um, so it's called compound because it usually has two lenses. There's the objective lens, which is what you rotate. Um, so right here, that's the objective lens. There's usually a 4X, which is uh, often referred to as scanning, 10X, 40, x and 100 x the x means that the image is being magnified by that many numbers so four times uh, magnification um, there's also an ocular lens right here the word ocular means eye and so this is what goes up to your eyeballs. Uh, this is also why in the time of COVID, it's really important to sterilize your microscope with alcohol or disinfectant prior to leaving the lab room. So those two lenses work together to help us m capture light and magnify our image. Um, so the uh, sample gets put onto this stage right here. This is the stage, this whole black structure right here. Um, the object goes above this hole and the light source or illuminator is going to shoot light through the condenser and the diaphragm 
uh, which contribute to the numerical aperture, and then that's going to focus the light through this hole specifically. Um, then we have it go passing through the slide right here. So it's going to go through there and create an image by being captured by the objective lens. Um, we adjust uh, resolution using the coarse focus knob and then more specifically the fine focus knob, which is usually on the outer portion of the coarse focus. Um, so those are going to help us raise and lower the stage, and that's going to help us bring the image into higher resolution. Usually you just use coarse focus until you see a flash of the image and know that you're close, then you use fine focus to really get good resolution. So this tool is really useful for viewing small slices. Remember that um, the, it's similar to the transmission electron microscope in that it doesn't show us the surface, but it shows us a thin slice of um, flattened cells, tissue, or other material. So the compound light microscope is what's called bright field microscopy. This produces a uh, dark image on a bright background usually. Um, this image over here is an example of a negative stain, like I mentioned earlier. Um, this is still an example of bright field. Uh, it's just that the slide itself is stained and the cells are rejecting the dye. So they're still kind of like the bright background. It's just that that negative space actually represents the cell. So um, th this tool, the light microscope or compound light microscope is common, it's accessible, it's easy to see the internal structures and then even the outlines of the external structures. Um, so it's useful, but it doesn't have perfect resolution and it's not possible to stain everything. So if you rely on staining either of the sample or the slide, um, and an object can't be stained or you have trouble doing negative staining with it for the level of detail you need, then this is not really a useful tool. So one thing to note before we go on to other types of microscopy is this idea of total magnification. Remember the numerical comparisons you'll have to make are with resolving power and then separately with total magnification. So again, we know that the ocular lens magnification is coming from that lens that's right by our eye. This is usually around 10x. So um, if no one tells you, you can probably assume that the ocular lens magnification is 10x on quizzes and exams, I will always tell you. So the objective lens is that one that we can rotate. Remember, it's either 4x, 10x, 40x, or 100x. So you just multiply those together to get the total magnification. When you look at samples under the microscope, um, I will be expecting you to record the total magnification. It's almost always 1000x in microbiology because uh, we have to use the 100x objective in order to actually see the image. So please make sure you get in the habit of writing that down. Sometimes we'll look at bigger things like blood cells or um, different uh, eukaryotes like protists or fungi um, under the microscope. And uh, when you do that, you want to make sure that you have the magnification recorded, the total magnification, so that you can make accurate comparisons and draw accurate conclusions. So the next type of microscopy is called dark field. And this is basically like a negative stain, but the microscope is doing it for you. Um, so it doesn't involve the application of any stain, which is really great because then the specimen can be kept alive. Usually stains are pretty dangerous for living organisms. Um, so the specimen can be kept alive. Um, the uh, kind of uh, image that you have um, is thin, um, and then it's also, remember, unstained. So this is really useful for viewing things like the um, spiral-shaped bacteria in the bottom left, and then that living what we call a copepod in the top. 
Um, that copepod is actually what plankton is on SpongeBob, if you've ever watched that. Um, so plankton, he, he's a zooplankton actually, and he's specifically a copepod. So this dark field microscopy, what it does is it involves a direct illumination block, which is just a fancy way of saying something that blocks the light. So it blocks most of the light and then just focuses a very uh, small hollow cone of light. That is going to help increase contrast without any staining. And the image ends up looking like a bright image on a dark background. So the next type of microscopy you should have on your table is phase contrast. I already mentioned this. Um, remember the goal here is to kind of redirect light and refract it and allow it to interfere with itself in different ways such that some of the wavelengths are canceled out. So um, the structures that actually end up refracting the light appear dark against a bright background of unrefracted light. So some features are going to appear lighter or darker than others. We end up getting really great resolution of the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. So you can see those internal organelle structures with a lot of detail, and you can see the outside structures like cilia or flagella with a lot of detail. So this is excellent resolution of all structures. Um, so for example, in bacteria, maybe pili in an internal structure for um, a pro uh, protists, maybe cilia and a nucleus. Um, so you don't have to do any fixing or staining for this, but this is very expensive and not very common. So it's more rare that you have access to this type of equipment. Another one is differential interference contrast, or DIC. Um, this really helps us produce high contrast 3D images and oftentimes of living organisms. So in the top GIF right there, those are uh, little protists called euglena. They have a red eye that helps them sense light. They have a flagella or flagellum that helps them move around and they're actually capable of photosynthesis. That's what all those chloroplasts are. So they're alive and we can observe them using differential interference contrast. Um, Another term for this is Namarsky optics. So if you ever see that terminology, that's what this is referring to. So another type of microscopy that I really want you guys to pay attention to, uh, especially in terms of the mechanism, is fluorescence microscopy. Fluorescence microscopy is a very important chemical tool, or, sorry, clinical tool, and it makes use of the antibody antigen reaction or interaction that is the basis of the immune system. So antibodies are Y-shaped proteins. That's what we see right here. And the pathogen, which has an antigen, which can be a small structure on the surface of the pathogen that's pretty unique to that pathogen. Um, so pathogen is something that causes disease. Um, so that antigen is actually going to attach up here on the white part. But we can shape this so that this bottom part of the uh, antibody actually physically matches up with something called a fluorochrome. So chrome means uh, color or light, and then fluoro is fluorescence. So this um, uh, glowing that actually happens is referred to here with the fluoro. So this is a pigment that is actually able to um, emit light and glow when it's exposed to certain wavelengths of light. So that's going to come in and physically attach to that base of the antibody. So we see those fluorochromes binding to the antibodies. Then the antibodies, the other part of them, if they match up with an antigen on an unknown bacterium, will stick to that bacterium. 
So here, this bacterial cell is bound not just to the antibody, but also to the fluorochrome. So then you can shoot this sample with a bunch of light, and if it glows, if it fluoresces, that means that you have confirmation of whatever that bacterium is. So two quick things. One, after you flood the bacterial cell with this complex, you have to wash off the remaining ones so that you don't get residual light. Um, another is that this structure is very, very specific to specific types of bacteria. So you really have to design it carefully, which is pretty expensive. You may be able to identify a bacterium with a high degree of accuracy and specificity, but this only works if you have the antibodies already designed, which is very expensive. So this is what that ends up looking like. Um, you can see that the individual bacteria are coated in the um, fluorochrome antibody um, complexes and we're able to really see distinct glowing. Another rare form of microscopy is called confocal. This is basically similar to um, the premise of CAT scans. So um, here, remember that just like with an X-ray, if you're using just basic microscopy, depth of field is really an issue. You're only seeing one slice at a time. But a CAT scan actually allows you to take a bunch of X-rays and put them together into one 3D model. Confocal microscopy does the same thing. You take a series of two-dimensional images and then actually put them together in a program that generates a 3D structure. So this is really cool because if you're looking for, for example, production of a protein or where a specific toxin is coming from in the cell, you can tag that protein or toxin fluorescently and then examine using this series of images where it specifically is being produced or stored within the cell. So we go from having those flat images to putting them together and really being able to model the three-dimensional aspect of the cell. So uh, one last form of kind of just general light microscopy is called two photon. Um, so this is really cool because you can uh, kind of observe physiological processes actually happening. Um, it uses a special scanning technique, fluorescence, and actually infrared light in order to image really thick samples like tissue or biofilms, which we'll talk about when we talk about microbial growth. Um, it's kind of a more advanced form of confocal microscopy. The problem is that a single two photon microscope usually costs between $300,000 and $500,000. So again, not really accessible. And the lasers that you use to actually excite those dyes and end up with one of these really interesting images um, is, are really expensive. So um, a more affordable two photon is what's in this top left image. There is actually a online artist store called Two Photon, where um, this person creates um, science-related art, including some really pretty enamel pins. So I definitely encourage you to check her out. Okay, so for electron microscopy, so that's the little table that comes next, that is using electrons instead of photons. And we end up with really good resolution um, after we've spent a lot of time preparing the samples. So again, scanning electron microscopy shows the surface. You can't really see internal structures. Transmission electron microscopy shows a slice. So they're prepared very differently. They, um, the technology is very different, but the premise is that they both use electrons uh, instead of light in order to visualize these images. Okay, so just a couple reminders and kind of an overview of what's going to be happening in lecture over the next couple of weeks.
Um, remember to please check Canvas very carefully. Um, hopefully by now you've read through the welcome letter, different announcements in the syllabus, but please do so if you haven't already. Um, look at the action items for the week one module. Remember that the microscopy worksheet for lecture is due Thursday, August 20th, um, so a week from the day that this lecture is scheduled. Um, definitely keep checking as material from week two gets posted, especially as the lab worksheets become available. I am hoping to have those posted um, by Friday at the latest, but hopefully earlier than that. Um, as we have Zoom recordings, if you're not able to join the in-person labs, please make sure that you are watching those and joining if possible, um, and then make sure that you're going through these entire pre-recorded YouTube lectures. Um, lab worksheets one and two aren't due until Monday, August 31st, but please don't let those pile up because you're going to have six big old packets of worksheets that are due at that time. And if anything, you don't want to be trying to scan those all to PDF um, at the last minute. So just an overview of the uh, kind of wrapping up today. So Thursday, August 13th, and then um, going over next week, um, we talked about kind of the background of microscopy today. On Tuesday's pre-recorded lecture, we'll think about the basics of microbial biochemistry. So kind of that same um, chemistry of life that you experience in Bio 5, Anatomy, and Physio at the start of the semester, um, but really geared towards microbiology. And then we'll integrate those ideas to think about microscopy a little bit further in terms of staining. So how does a stain interact with the biochemical structure of a cell in order to visualize it under the microscope? 